Dear participants on GLAD, as the co-organizer, to welcome you to this first webinar of a series on four on climate change and energy security for NATO nations. As all of you are aware of, uh, these two topics are um, far more than 10 years, increasingly growing as major concerns in the field of international relations and could tomorrow be at the core of strategic competition. Thus, FRS and NSEC COE decided with the support of AI and the collaboration of the EU Commission to organize a series of webinars to gather experts from political, military, business, and the academia to discuss and engage um, and share insights on the different dimension of these issues. Um, my introduction well, will be very, very short, and I think that uh, I will pass the floor, first of all, to uh, Colonel Romuald Perskevicius, the director of NSEC COE, uh, for the introduction of this whole series. Thank you and uh, a nice conference. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you for this, uh, for this kind introduction and partnering with us. Thank you for Foundation for the Research Strategic to, uh, for, for co-organizing this event and basically, uh, basically uh, carrying the all, all burden. And I was informed that I will have two opportunities to speak today, so I'll use both if, if you don't mind. And, and first, uh, first of all, I, I, would, I would use this opportunity to to introduce uh, to, to their uh, participants and greetings to all of you. Thank you for joining us uh, for, for this first uh, webinar in series of four. But I would like to use this opportunity a few minutes to introduce you NATO Energy Security Center of Excellence. We are actually a NATO accredited international organization with uh, 12 members now. France is one of those uh, members and France is actually a member who, who was at the beginning of, of, uh, of establishment of the center and we were established in uh, 2013 with the mission to assist NATO and the partner nations with all uh, with expertise on all aspects of energy security and and we, you wouldn't believe how busy we are you know I, I was first establishing director I am now on the second term as the director and our hands are full with the with the questions on, uh, uh, we basically follow the, the lines how NATO approaches energy security. First, we're raising awareness among NATO and partner nations on the, on the issues of energy security. Second, to look at and provide expertise and advice on protection of critical energy infrastructure. And, and finally, to concentrate on uh, military uh, energy efficiency uh, for, uh, uh, for NATO and uh, NATO partner uh, Forces. That's how we organize. Uh, that's how we organize our job. And you can imagine how wide our portfolio is, uh, starting from uh, very strategic uh, level issues on energy security down to the really, really nitty gritty details on uh, protection of critical energy infrastructure from cyber attacks and different type of attacks, and down to the to the to the military energy efficiency. And we do this in in basically four lines. We have strategic research providing the studies on different different topics. We have we are partnering uh, the same with Foundation for the Research Strategy, but also with different other educational institutions. We provide training for uh, for military and civilian organizations, and we provide tabletop exercises in the area of energy security, not only for for the military, but for uh, for civilian, uh, governmental, non-governmental authorities who deal with energy security. Uh, 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 for instance, this year we'll 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 do the exercise together with the uh, GRC Joint Research Center of uh, European Commission on the synchronization issues in, in the Baltics and the synchronization of electric, electrical networks. But also we provide the exercises for delivering of fuel supplies in the Baltic region in times of crisis uh, and war and things like that. We do research, we do research and analysis. We have a special, uh, special division for that. And of course, most importantly, we have doctrine and concept development division who concentrates on actually developing the documents, how military should approach uh, be, to be more energy efficient. I'll stop here, Nicolas. Uh, so whoever wants to visit uh, nsexioe.org is our web website. Please join us there or shoot an email to me or, uh, or to anybody else in the center. Thank you.
Thank you very much from you all of us uh, for, for this very interesting presentation of NSEX Theory. Uh, Xavier Pasco, so director of the FRS, will present uh, our, our center of research, which is uh, slightly different, but also very interesting in, this, uh, in these topics. Thank you, Nicolas. Thank you, Colonel. And ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon. So I'm Xavier Pasco. Yes, I'm the director of the Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique. Uh, Foundation for Strategic Research. It's a Paris-based uh, think tank and, and the main independent French research center on international security and defense issues. Uh, we're basically a, a, a bunch of academics and experts, uh, a, a small structure, but with a lot of, uh, of expertise uh, looking at different uh, issues, mainly uh, structured along different thematics and energy is one of those and Nicolas is uh, in charge of this, uh, of this activity uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, in our center. We're also looking at other uh, military and international security issues such as uh, uh, nuclear, space, the, uh, cyber and all these kind of things. And also we have regional expertise on some particular, particularly interested zones uh, in the world, whether it's uh, Russia, China, East Asia, and on, on Middle East, for example. So I will stop there, but uh, we are very, uh, uh, also, we are very busy these days, as you can understand. I'm particularly pleased to uh, open this webinar with Colonel Pekevich, uh, uh, as this represents the first, uh, as it was said, of a series of activities uh, FRS will conduct with the, the, the Energy Security Center of Excellence uh, in Venus. And this cooperation has been formalized uh, by a letter of intent signed between our two organizations in, in 20, 2018. And, uh, um, uh, uh, a first conference had to take place in Paris some time ago, but as we all had to undergo this, uh, this, uh, this crisis situation, this sanitary situation, has led us to convert this into a, into a, a series of, of webinars. Um, for a few years already, uh, FRS has carried out, uh, I would say, pioneering, pioneering work uh, in the field of energy, climate change, dig digitalization also uh, uh, um, and for defense. Uh, a lot of research work has been uh, produced, has been carried out in close connection with uh, national or European or even international uh, uh, military operators and institutions, uh, the French Ministry of Armed Forces, the European Defense Agency, and also, of course, NATO. Uh, this research has, uh, has uh, is, is developed at FRS is both uh, um, uh, intended to be, in a sense, very operational and be, be, being led in, in close connection with, with our military uh, partners, but also it's, it's, it's destined to be rather didactic uh, with the objective uh, in this latter case to open up to a large audience, and, and a national, European, international audience. Uh, climate change and energy security issues have been uh, emerging as, as, as you said, Nicola, as one of the most crucial questioning for the armed forces. Uh, you're all aware of the recent uh, defense, uh, uh, French defense energy strategy that's been presented last September, in September 2020, by the French Ministry of Armed Forces. Um, there are also many multilateral organizations or frameworks, I would say, that pay attention to this, such as, for example, I'm thinking about the strategic compass has been uh, uh, existing at the EU level, but also the NATO 2030 uh, reflections. Uh, um, and so this series of, of webinars uh, that will take place uh, in the next few weeks, uh, starting from today, uh, reflect the different dimensions of the issue. And I will summarize a bit uh, how it's been organized in a sense, in our minds, maybe in mine, but I, I hope it, you share this, uh, this tractor. Um, of course, we will have a, a common assessment first, and this will be the subject of this first seminar today, of the, of the risk brought about by the uh, evolution of the climate and in, in the climate and in energy fields, and the role uh, and the capabilities of the armed forces in this domain, so that it will be a large tour d'horizon in a sense. Uh, a second webinar will question uh, how, we, we, how this can translate in different territories uh, uh, in the vicinity of, of NATO, uh, whether it's Mediterranean, Africa, Middle East, Antarctica also, of course. Uh, a, third, a third webinar will, uh, will look at the adaptation of the armed forces uh, in terms of visions, uh, doctrine, 
and, um, and, 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 and you know, how it can combine with operational uh, missions and constraints for the armed forces. And uh, uh, of course, a, a, a last webinar, I think, will look more at the industry aspect of this, industry response to this, how uh, this can connect with the, uh, the military and, 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 and uh, visions and, and interests. Uh, France has had a particular experience that's true in this field, uh, due of it, it's, of, to, to its in operational engagements, uh, uh, but also in its, uh, with its engagement in NATO along, alongside its, its, its partners. Um, and uh, I, I, I really uh, think that uh, we will have a very fruitful exchanges uh, in the course of these four webinars. Uh, I would like to take benefit of uh, this moment also to finally uh, thank, as you said, Nicola, uh, the European Commission, but also our, our counterpart in Italy, uh, International uh, uh, Affairs Institute for International Affairs in Rome, who is partnering with us on this. And um, so I, I thank you all for being with us today. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm now convinced that we will have very, very fruitful exchange, exchanges. I will not give you the floor. I won't be uh, longer than that. Uh, Nicola, uh, uh, who you are in charge of this, of these domains at, at the foundation. And so uh, thank you. Thank you again for, for being with us. And uh, Nicola, you have the floor. Uh, many thanks, Xavier. Uh, many thanks for, for giving us the, the insights of the, the whole um, series of webinars and the interconnection between the four different webinars and uh, their different topics. Uh, but I pass the floor uh, as fast as possible to, to Romeo Aldas to, to act as uh, our, um, our keynote speaker, our fire starter today, uh, in order to, to present this global. Uh, framework of reflection for this first webinar before starting with the panelist presentation. Thank you, Romeo Aldas. Well, I think you're still muted. We, we can't hear you. That's better. One thing that you will learn after so many meetings uh, on Zoom and Teams that you learn to unmute yourself, but still happens. You know, sorry about that, but uh, thank you, Nicolas, for intro and Xavier, most importantly, for introducing this uh, this uh, series uh, series of webinars. We are really excited, you know, and most importantly, as Xavier mentioned, this was planned to to be live event in the in in Paris, in the in the nicest location you can think in Europe, but still. Still, we are happy to, to meet with you virtually because what we need now uh, are the ideas. Are the ideas how do we approach this, uh, uh, this issue with climate change? And I'm, not the, uh, I'm really not the expert. That's why I'm uh, happy to participate uh, in this event uh, together with you to listen, uh, to, listen to, everybody's, to everybody's idea. But be, before, and I will be very short. I just want to to to, to center uh, us on on uh, where we see ourselves uh, here in this uh, in this uh, in this time frame uh, as 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 far as approach uh, as the approach to climate change goes, uh, both in the military and civilian societies. And recently, you know, in Lithuania, we are we are now in the big celebration mood because in April Lithuania joined NATO. You know, so there are serious interviews being conducted. I am one of the older guys who still remember the times when we were not members of NATO that we joined. So I was asked uh, by military media, the, you know, the question, so what, uh, uh, can you speak on the future implications of climate change for NATO? Really, very topical question. You know, just last week, you know, it happened. You know, very easy for me was to, and you know, I was thinking on my response, you know, and usually, you know, when the, somebody asks you about the future, you always think, you know, how we have those nice numbers of, okay, something will be done by 2020, something, by 2030, something by 2050. Uh, and you know, when I was thinking about an answer, I couldn't find the date in the future when we will be ready to deal with uh, climate change. Because what I realized, the climate change has happened. It's happened, it's already here. So do we have until 2030 or, or until 2050? No, we don't have until 2050 anymore. And anyway, you know, for guys like me, 2050, it's too late anyway, you know, because you know, natural causes, you know, might happen, you know, not the climate change. So the, the, the issue is we have to deal with this issue now. 
And uh, since we at the Energy Security Center of Excellence are postured, you know, to look at the issues of, uh, of energy security, both including the approaches to energy security, but also approaches to the new innovative energy solutions, both for civilian societies and, and the military, we decided that it's at the same time we have to look at the climate change as well. But you know, you, you see me, I'm wearing military uniform. For, for me, it's important to, to, to understand, can military sit this one out? You know, can we do just nothing? And, and, and as we were doing long time with energy efficiency, we were, we were not that much involved in energy efficiency because for most reasoning in the military was used, if we implement those energy efficient solutions for the military, we might negatively impact our combat capability, which never happened, never happened. We introduced innovations in energy sector in the military, and that's only improved combat capability. So we cannot sit out the climate change. We are not shielded in the, mili in the military uh, from climate change. And it's, it, it, I'm happy to recognize that some nations like France uh, actually provide in the military sphere, they provide leadership. United States, Germany, Italy, militaries are getting ready and understanding what challenges this, this will bring. And those challenges can be significant. Of course, understanding, you know, what implications this might have to geostrategic environment and security environment of the nations or the regions that we're protecting is one. But, but it might require certain investments in re-equipping ourselves, okay? To be more climate uh, friendly, climate understanding with our equipment, with the biggest, uh, uh, with the biggest, you know that the biggest pollutants, at least, are air forces and the navy. How can we approach it? Uh, what we can do in the military? This might require a certain investment in in even the equipment. The only important promise that I can make is that it will not have negative impact to our combat abilities or combat capabilities. It will only make us better and prepared for the future challenges. So last point that I would make, uh, want to make is, where do military look for the leadership? In, in which direction to go? How to approach it in, in kind of consolidated matter? That's where the NATO comes in. That's where the NATO comes in, especially here in European region. NATO has been most trusted most proven alliance for the military providing, you know, single kind of line approach in, in, in terms of training, in, in, in terms of military capability development, in, in, in terms of joint action. So many European nations, including uh, United States and Canada, are looking for NATO for the leadership in this uh, preparing for the climate change. The good news is, that this issue is not new for NATO as well, because already in, in, in 2010, in the strategic concept, NATO recognized that climate change might have the implications uh, for, the, for the security. And then the uh, Green uh, Framework was uh, accepted in 2014. And uh, last year, the latest development on NATO 2030, you know, climate change was mentioned. Secretary General has uh, climate change on his uh, agenda and speeches very oftenly, uh, and I would say that even establishment of the NATO Energy Security Center of Excellence was one of the approaches how NATO uh, got closer to the to addressing the issues of the climate change. So NATO is ready for that. The only issue is that uh, this has to be brought under NATO's day-to-day -day agenda. Climate change should be in as part of the NATO core business. That, that, that's the only way I can, do, uh, can say it. So, so that's three points that I would like to make. Climate change is here and now. We have to deal with it. I'm happy that we have group of experts throughout those uh, four webinars. I believe we'll have thousands of ideas how to approach it. And we'll be able in uh, NATO Energy Security Center of Excellence develop the course for advanced distance learning to train, to change the understanding in our military forces, how to approach to the, to the, to the energy security. So the climate change is now, 
military is not shielded from it. We have to deal with it. We have to be ready. And NATO as an organization should provide leadership. I don't, I don't uh, think the NATO will be the main point who deals with global aspects of energy security. But as far as, uh, as uh, military and security aspects go, NATO has to, has to take the leadership in here uh, and position themselves as, as, uh, in, in this direction. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. And I'm really looking forward to, to being with you throughout these events. Well, many, many thanks, uh, Romeo. Uh, as you stressed out, international cooperation uh, is very important topic for the military and not only the military to, to address uh, this very global challenge. And of course, today's webinar is dedicated to international organization perspectives on this role of the military regarding climate change and energy security issues. As the recent works uh, you mentioned, also Xavier mentioned, on NATO uh, 2030, also in the EU with the EU climate change and defense roadmap, highlights that NATO and the EU are well aware of uh, these issues. Uh, yet it's also fundamental to understand with a broader perspective which role the armed forces and the defense sector could play uh, in terms of adaptation and mitigation of climate change issues. And to help us understand these issues, we have four high-level speakers that will deliver a 15-minute presentation each before opening the questions to the audience. If you have a question, do not hesitate to um, uh, post it on the dedicated space, on the chat, and uh, thereafter, just after the presentation, uh, we will go to the Q&A session. So first of all, as she won't be able to, to stay with us for the Q&A session, uh, Ms. Claudia Canavari from DGNR will present the EU perspective. Ms. Canavari is the head of uh, Energy Efficiency Unit at the DGNR of the EU Commission. She has been working for uh, at the EU Commission for 25 years, especially being member of Cabinet of Commissioner Stavros Dimitros, uh, the, so the Environment Commissioner, and thus coordinating the international negotiations on the climate change team. So, Claudia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola, uh, and uh, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, uh, I'm very happy to be uh, here with you uh, today. Uh, in fact, as you heard, uh, I dealt with climate change already uh, quite a long time ago when uh, there was only one unit in DG Environment in the Commission that was dealing with climate change and it was a little bit unknown. So uh, it's very good to see how much interest uh, this uh, topic is, uh, 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 let's say, uh, taking uh, uh, now. And this is, in fact, uh, only, only good and only positive. Uh, so it is really a pleasure for me to be uh, here with you to be part of this event. Uh, uh, as Nicolas said, um, uh, I will not be able to follow until uh, the end, uh, uh, but uh, um, uh, I hope that uh, um, uh, I, I could contribute to the discussion and I will certainly look forward to hearing more uh, uh, afterwards. I would like to focus my contribution on the most uh, uh, recent uh, energy developments uh, in the EU and uh, uh, how the defense sector could be part uh, of all these. Uh, published in uh, December 2019, the European Green Deal is the main uh, flagship of the current Commission. It sets, uh, uh, as you know, the general aim and ambition of being uh, the first climate neutral continent uh, by 2050. And all sectors and policy areas uh, need to contribute to this historical uh, challenge. And the defense and security sector, because of the nature uh, it has, uh, and also because of the energy consumption it is responsible for, can clearly give a remarkable contribution, uh, thus uh, uh, benefiting from the advantages uh, that the clean energy transition and the fight against the climate change can bring. Uh, a key element uh, of the European Green Deal is that uh, uh, energy efficiency needs uh, to be prioritized because without energy efficiency, the decarbonization goal for 2050 uh, will not be reached. Uh, it is uh, uh, something that we've been knowing uh, for quite a long time. Uh, and I just would like uh, to uh, uh, refer to, uh, for example, a commission communication uh, that was adopted in November uh, 2018. Uh, the title is A Clean Planet for All. And there uh, it was uh, clearly indicated that without uh, 
energy efficiency, it is impossible to reach uh, um, uh, climate change results. In fact, in fact uh, uh, energy efficiency is part uh, of all uh, decarbonization scenarios. Um, however, it is only with uh, the European Green Deal that the need to prioritize energy efficiency in relation to the fight against climate change and to have a more sustainable development uh, was made so clear. And I'm sure that uh, you have uh, um, uh, been following the different uh, uh, Green Deal uh, uh, initiatives that has been uh, that that were launched by the uh, the Commission uh, uh, recently. But I would like just to mention a few of them, uh, as I think that they could be particularly relevant for the defence sector. One is the renovation wave uh, that calls uh, for the rapid deployment uh, of renovation in buildings. Uh, and of course, uh, the defense sector has a lot of buildings uh, that are used for military, but also for civil uh, uh, work. And this is therefore why this uh, uh, renovation wave is uh, particularly important. Then uh, there is the strategy for energy system integration that out outlines uh, uh, a vision to create a smarter, more integrated uh, and more optimized uh, energy systems uh, system in which uh, all sector can fully contribute to the decarbonization. So again, uh, a key role for the defense sector there. And the third uh, initiative I would like to mention, there are many more, but I didn't want to, uh, to make too long a list, is the European Climate Law that was uh, published uh, recently and that uh, provides uh, a solid legal basis for our actions uh, to further address uh, climate change. Um, but this is uh, just, uh, uh, as I said, just a few examples, but I would like then to recall something very important, uh, uh, and it is uh, that uh, by the end of June uh, this year, so in a couple of months' time, in fact, uh, the Commission will adopt the so-called FIT for 55 package, which will include uh, energy and climate proposals uh, to further equip uh, the European Union with the necessary tools uh, to cost-effectively decarbonize uh, its economy and its society. And this is a package that encompasses uh, climate and energy. There will be uh, seven proposals, uh, two are from DG Energy and uh, five are from DG Clima, but of course they are from the Commission. Uh, and what is important uh, that I would like to particularly underline is that the coherence uh, amongst uh, these uh, different uh, proposals uh, is being ensured. The Commission is working uh, uh, very closely uh, in order to make, to make sure that there, is, uh, there are no contradictions, uh, that there is coherence uh, and that uh, the different instruments uh, that are part of this package are uh, mutually, uh, mutually supporting uh, and reinforcing each other. And as part of this uh, package, you will see that there will be uh, the revision of the Energy Efficiency Directive and the revision of the Renewables uh, uh, Directive. And this is uh, something uh, that will be very important because it is essential to provide member states, uh, industries, uh, consumers, uh, all the different economic sectors, um, all the different societal sectors, including defense, uh, with all uh, let's say the good and, and well-structured uh, set of policies and measures uh, to reach the results. And once more, the defense sector will be part uh, of these actions uh, and the challenges. Um, then I would like to recall uh, um, uh, another, to, 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 bring, to uh, let's say, bring to your attention another topic, uh, which is uh, slightly different, uh, but clearly related. And it is uh, the unprecedented recovery package that the EU leaders confirmed the last July, the next generation EU. As you know, it underlines the importance of a green and digital transition and foresees uh, a recovery and resilience facility with more than 670 billion euros to fund projects identified by member states in the national recovery uh, plans. Uh, and this is something that is being developed by member states at the moment. The deadline for the submission of the final plans is at the end of April. Uh, and what is interesting is that uh, some 37% of these recovery and resilience facility funds, so 37% of the 600, uh, 670 billion I mentioned before, 
will be will be uh, spent uh, for climate related uh, uh, actions so you can see how big the magnitude of these funds are is really as i said an unprecedented uh, package and an unprecedented opportunity to work in the direction of climate change and all sectors uh, are entitled to uh, uh, to apply for these uh, uh, for these funds and of course it depends on how member states will define their priorities in their national recovery and resilience plans and the two of the seven uh, uh, flagships uh, of this uh, uh, recovery and resilience facility refer specifically to energy. One is uh, called the Power Up, and uh, it aims uh, at accelerating uh, uh, future proof uh, clean technologies. And the second one is called Renovate, and it is to improve the energy and resource efficiency of uh, public and private buildings. One, once more, you can see that both of these uh, flagship initiatives linked to energy are very, uh, let's say, appropriate also for the defense uh, uh, sector. Uh, and it's clearly, um, uh, uh, let's say, a, a, a big uh, chance, a big opportunity for the defense and security sector to significantly contribute to uh, the overarching objectives uh, of sustainability and economic recovery at the same time. And uh, uh, obviously, uh, the, the, your, your sector, the defense and security sector, clearly has a key role to play uh, in, uh, in this area. Uh, as uh, uh, the colonel already mentioned, uh, a stronger focus on sustainability does not mean uh, less effective uh, armed forces, uh, but rather the contrary, as the very same actions uh, which will allow reducing uh, the energy consumption and integrating a larger share of renewable energy sources will make uh, the armed forces more resilient uh, in case of serious disruptions uh, of the civilian energy system, for example, just, just to name one uh, advantage. Uh, the Commission has uh, uh, seen uh, the potential of uh, uh, the role of the uh, armed forces in relation su to sustainable energy already uh, for quite some years. Um, uh, in 2018, uh, we launched uh, uh, the uh, consultation forum on sustainable energy in the defense and security sector together with the uh, European Defense Agency. And this is uh, um, uh, a consultation forum that aims uh, at looking at sustainable uh, energy sources, so uh, renewables and energy efficiency, but also uh, at critical energy infrastructure, with the idea of, uh, uh, let's say, increasing uh, the understanding of the advantages of these areas for the defense uh, and security sector, and at the same time, enhancing the contribution of the sectors. And it has been a very useful experience. We are now in the third phase that will last for four more years, which is extremely positive, showing a lot of interest from the side of the member states, from the ministries of defense, and in a few days' time, on the 14th of April, the Commission is organizing, together with the European Defense Agency, the first climate, sorry, the first energy and defense uh, meeting. Uh, um, it, it, it includes uh, uh, only representatives from the member states, it's not open to the public, but is a good signal of the importance that both uh, the ministries of energy on the one side and the ministries of defense on the other side uh, uh, see in working together and finding uh, enhancing synergies. And we hope uh, that that will be just uh, the first of a series of these uh, events. Uh, and in any case, uh, we will continue uh, 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 working uh, in the context uh, of uh, uh, these uh, very important and successful consultation forum. So mm -hmm. I think it's... Uh, very important to see that the defense community is very much interested in uh, dealing with climate change, in addressing climate change, in addressing, therefore, uh, the clean energy transition or in, in taking the route towards the clean energy transition. Uh, because, I mean, at the end, uh, uh, it's clear that uh, uh, once more unity is a strength, uh, so it's very good uh, to have all sectors contributing. Uh, uh, again, many thanks uh, uh, to everyone for having invited me to this uh, uh, event. Uh, and as I said, uh, uh, I look forward uh, to hearing uh, about uh, how the discussion uh, uh, will proceed uh, uh, and also about the, the, the remaining uh, uh, three uh, webinars. Thank you very much and have a very nice uh, uh, afternoon.
Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. Um, and uh, I think that it's very important that you mention uh, this conference on April the 14th and uh, the, the importance of the EU to help gathering the defence community with other communities, especially, for example, this initiative with defence ministries and energy ministries uh, all, uh, all over Europe. Um, now we will have uh, uh, Dr. Jeanine Foucault from Royal Holloway University of London to, to speak. Dr. Cole uh, is also Associate Fellow at the De Rousey and the Public Health Policy Advisor at the Rockefeller Economic on Planetary Health at Oxford University. Her research is focuses on natural hazards impacts and she will present us the role of armed forces and defense in such major uh, climatic event, but also in terms of resilience, I think that uh, resilience since the the start of this COVID crisis has been the most important buzzword uh, for two years. So, uh, Jennifer, please uh, help us to understand. Uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, are you happy for me to share slides? We can see them. Yeah, you can see them. Okay. Thank you. I'll just open it up. Um, so, thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, as I said, I, I wear a number of different hats, one of which is a, as an academic. Um, I'm also an Associate Fellow at RUSI, which is a Defence and Security Think Tank. Um, and you'll see I've actually kind of badged this from the, the academic role um, and my role in the Geography Department. And there's a number of reasons I go through that I'm going to come back to this and, and why, in a way, I'm approaching it from this direction. Um, the questions that the workshop overall is looking at um, are really about these, the cooperation between climate change outside of the military and perhaps, as the Colonel mentioned, you know, who are the leaders who take this forward? Who do we need to look to work with? Um, and also then, how do defence and security organisations prepare for conducting missions related to climate change? Um, and then actually, what, what does the military need to do in terms of the technology in the R&B? And I think all of these come back to some of the questions of resilience that I was particularly asked to address, which were around, is cooperation between, you know, really, do, do we understand the scope and the nature of the challenge? And I think that's perhaps one thing, certainly from the academic and think tank world we can bring, is perhaps a new perspective on the, the scope of the challenge. And then the questions I was specifically asked to look at, um, and I've highlighted the things in those that I think is important, is how do we understand resilience in the face of a, a major climatic event? And, and I think we need to think of that is what is resilience to the military? And does that dovetail with what the civilian world means by resilience as well? And then what is the role of the armed forces in that? So specifically as defence and security organisations, what do we need to think about? Um, and then it was how to model the, the black swan in training. And that really comes back to the do we understand the scope in nature? Because I'm not convinced that anything around climate change should be a black swan. I think we actually have the amount of information that we need, the amount of data and the amount of preparation to know what we're facing um, and to actually be reasonably well prepared for that. Um, so in terms of my background, I'm a full-time academic now, but I was for 10 years at RUSI as a, a full-time policy researcher there. Um, I'm also the Northern European coordinator for the Planetary Health Alliance, which is a, a group of universities and, and agencies led from Harvard University in the US, which looks specifically at the role of the environment in human health and well-being. Um, and so particularly how the environment impacts um, on our health. Um, and I'm also a infodemic manager for the World Health Organization, which looks at particularly the role of, of public health messaging um, and misinformation within that. Um, but what I really want to focus on in this is some work that I did at RUSI going back to really going back now 10 or 12 years, which was around the kind of security threats that we were going to face in the 21st century. Um, and I, I did this paper back about 12 years ago now called Securing Our, Our Future, um, Resilience in the 21st Century. And it came out of a talk I was invited to give at Oxford University, um, for which I, I tried to think of what the main threats were. And to me, I thought one of the, the main differences between 21st century is that we were really facing defense without an enemy. We'd come out of a period of the Cold War, you know, we'd come out of NATO itself being a product of the Second World War where what we'd really been looking at was state-on-state -state warfare. And as we went into the 21st century, the biggest risks were going to be from climate change, from flooding, from droughts, from pandemics. Um, and that 
the, the defense mechanisms that we had and the way that both militaries internally within nations and, and perhaps also across NATO and across the world are organized aren't necessarily the best structures um, to address those. And this really became very apparent about two or three years ago at the, the NATO Resilience Conference in Virginia in the US, which was done um, jointly with the Rockefeller 100 Resilient Cities Programme to talk about resilience. And, and we had a room full of probably about 500 people, some of whom were from the civilian world from the Rockefeller cities, the other half of whom were from NATO. And they really were quite markedly talking different languages. When the civilians talked about resilience, they really talked about flooding, they talked about regenerating cities, they talked about societal cohesion. Um, and when the military talked about resilience, they talked about massive cyber attack from Russia. And there wasn't really a lot of joint discussion in the middle of that. Um, and also when you're talking about threats with an enemy that comes from an enemy, I think what that also does is set up a situation in which it's far more difficult than it's going to need to be within the future to work internationally with partners who haven't traditionally been our allies. Um, and I'll go in specifically in that. I think some of the issues this has thrown up around the coronavirus response and working with China. Um, I think one of the things that NATO adds value into the world, a world where we are, are facing a new kind of threat, which is more from natural disasters and from climate change um, than it is from traditional state threats and where things like the issues we've talked about, perhaps transitioning to a greener type of military, to a more energy efficient military, to, to all of the things that the civilian world would think of. Um, I think definitely that humanitarian response is going to become far more important. I think food security is going to become a much bigger issue in the future. And actually some of the issues around climate change and energy and food security in terms of the way that we produce food, which is, is not particularly energy efficient, haven't traditionally been our allies. Um, and I'll go in specifically in that. I think some of the issues this has thrown up around the coronavirus response and working with China. Um, I think one of the things that NATO adds value into the world, a world where we are are facing a new kind of threat, which is more from natural disasters and from climate change um, than it is from traditional state threats and where things like the issues we've talked about, perhaps transitioning to a greener type of military, to a more energy efficient military, to, to all of the things that the civilian world would think of. Um, I think definitely that humanitarian response is going to become far more important. I think food security is going to become a much bigger issue in the future. And actually some of the issues around climate change and energy and food security in terms of the way that we produce food, which is, is not particularly energy efficient, the way that we currently transport food across large distances, which isn't particularly energy efficient, the, the way in which we are, we encourage people to store and cook food hygienically, which is largely very energy intensive, um, isn't necessarily the way that we will secure energy resilience into the future um, and particularly some of the issues this has, this has around climate driven migration um, which again is a major issue because at the moment all of our really the way that we define refugees and the ways that we define refugee aid is around people who are fleeing persecution or fleeing conflict um, we don't currently legally recognize people who are, are fleeing flooding or their the lands they live on not being able to produce food anymore as refugees. Um, and I think as NATO perhaps reorients to helping out in some of those situations, to be having a much more humanitarian response role to perhaps helping with migration issues, um, NATO also has to make sure that it is self-sustaining. One thing that we did look at very strongly in the, the NATO conference is that if NATO troops go into a country that is struggling to feed its own people, struggling to have the electricity grid, to support its own people. NATO has to make sure that its own troops are self-sustaining and not adding to those issues. Um, so I, th I think looking at how NATO can make sure it supports its own people within that without being a burden on the countries it's moving into um, can actually help to drive some of these, certainly the, the research and technology around this forward. And I think the, the real value that NATO adds in those kind of situations is search, certainly logistics, um, that, that NATO troops and NATO as an organization has fantastical logistical capabilities that I think are going to become increasingly important. 
I think just capability and capacity in general, the, the ability to go in and to manage disasters, to manage a crisis, to coordinate the different agencies, to provide communications, to provide field kitchens, to provide some of that energy infrastructure, perhaps back to the, the countries itself, is going to become increasingly important. Being able to respond rapidly, being able to move people around very quickly and to do what is needed in a very agile manner is going to be very useful. Um, and I think particularly kind of coordination at, at a national level. And again, sometimes if we start to see some climate change impacts almost in an Article 5 viewpoint, where NATO has a responsibility to it, its member states to help them out, and also possibly to other countries as well. If, if they sit outside of NATO as a coalition, um, but they need that help, is this actually a role that NATO as a peacekeeping organization and a coordination organization can move into? So it becomes more of a humanitarian response organization, perhaps regardless of where that humanitarian disaster is. And I think the, the things that we have to be cautious within this is that NATO as a military organization is going to find it very difficult to avoid being both politicized and both securitized, which might not always be what is perhaps the best in that situation, particularly if some of the people who are impacted are, are outside of the normal NATO channels. Um, and to give you some of the examples of this, um, if we look at where climate security is actually going to impact most strongly um, over the next 50 years, there are going to be winners and losers. We tend to talk of, of climate change in terms of you know, a problem for the whole world um, and apocalyptic, apocalyptic narratives. Um, but actually, in, certainly in terms of food production, the global north is probably going to become more fertile to be able to produce more food, um, whereas the global south is going to be impacted harder. Now, this is actually an interesting one for NATO, because if you actually see on that, most of NATO's countries and most of NATO's members are going to be on the on the winning side of this. Um, so they're going to feel the impacts far less sharply. Um, they're perhaps going to see not so much conflict and disruption and, and migration within their own borders, um, but they may increasingly, NATO states and NATO members may get drawn into problems overseas and particularly in the global south um, and how to deal with countries who that simply cannot produce enough food for its, its people anymore. Um, and I show you two of the photos there, one of which is Blackpool, which is a popular seaside resort in the UK. Um, if Blackpool becomes much hotter and sunnier um, and you see beautiful golden sands there, that's going to be quite an advantage for Blackpool. Um, whereas if you see it in Bangalore in the photo of the south, that's an area where I'm doing some field work with Royal Holloway. It used to be... Uh, um, an agricultural... Uh, and old blue bushes don't easily grow of a duck pond Um, is certainly something I think is going to become more of an impact in the future. So we look at some of the challenges that we're having and say that, that I think large facing uh, things like famine and always flood and the migration that draws we quite some apocalyptic narrative that we're in a climate emergency is becoming kind of increasingly a, a good topic for fiction to see you know how the world will collapse when all of this happens. But I think one of the things we do have to ask is, does this, does this have to act, does this have to lead to war? Or actually it is a real role for NATO as a, a peacekeeping organization and very much the idea of peace through NATO um, in Europe sort of since the Second World War. Do, does NATO actually take on that far more of a peacekeeping role, a coordination role, um, and looking out to how we coordinate with other countries? Um, if we look particularly at COVID, um, and I bring it into this because this is really where most of the work that I've been doing in the geopolitical arena and also with Rusi over the last few months has been focused. What we've been looking at is what can we learn from the, the response to COVID that might teach us lessons for the way that we're responding to climate change in the future and how we address some of those issues around, you know, as was mentioned, the fact that we're tending to miss some of our energy reduction 
targets. Um, if we're not working together as well as we might on climate change, what problems is going, this going to sort, store up for the future and what can we learn about the, the response from COVID on that? Um, so we've, we've been toying around with this idea that my colleague Klaus Dodds and I um, have been calling unhealthy geopolitics. You know, what, what does the, the pandemic tell us about where geopolitics are unhealthy and, and what problems do we think this is storing up? Um, and one of the things particularly, I think, is, is what we call the geographic imagination. And this, this goes back to the ideas of, of, do we really understand the scope of the challenge? Do we imagine the world in a certain way? Because we tend to see the world in, ter in terms of friend and foe. And that tends to very much um, cloud how we see certain countries and certain countries' responses to things. And very much in the early days of the pandemic, when there were uh, news stories were starting to come out of China, uh, what most of the news stories focused on China as an authoritarian, brutal regime um, that was forcing people to stay in its houses, that, that was really doing human rights abuses. Um, there was a lot of looking at kind of digging graves and were they burning bodies and were they covering anything up. Um, and this was a, a very, it was very kind of looking at China as the enemy that perhaps we've, we've been conditioned to do. Um, and I think what this meant was that while we were looking at China as, as an enemy and looking at the problems in China, we actually missed what was really going on. Um, and so we, we missed sort of how quickly China was building coronavirus hospitals, which, which really told you that there was, there was really something serious going on here. If a country is clearing vast swathes of land to build hospitals, um, it's really worried about what's happening to its population. Um, there was a lot of sharing on, on social media of, of images from Chinese from people in Wuhan who were being locked in their homes and, and the response to this was kind of what a terrible thing China is doing rather than actually in a pandemic what you really want to do is, is keep people in their homes you want to make them stay at home um, and one of the real, real dangers I think this had is if, if you look at this map um, this graph from John Hopkins University of how the number of COVID cases around the world grew the, this line here um, the orange one right at the beginning of the end of December is when China told the world that the coronavirus pandemic was happening. It, it was when it was announced to the World Health Organization and that information was available to the world. This line here is when the UK had its first COVID case. So you've already, you've already got a period of over a month when we knew that there is this new very dangerous disease has emerged. We know that it's spreading. We know there were cases in Italy, but actually we have the first case in the UK here. And we're still not really doing anything about it. It's not till here in the UK till the end of March and the, the dates around a lot of countries in the world, particularly the US, were the same, where we actually really start to take serious measures about against it. Um, we've actually had a period of, of, of three and a half, nearly four months where we've known that this is coming and, and largely we've ignored it. And if you think of that in terms of, you know, had this been a bomb, had this been a missile that, that China had fired at the UK, had this been a cyber attack that China had done on the UK, we wouldn't really have sat around and done nothing for nearly four months. And I think that idea of how we see the world, what do we see as a threat? What do we see as a danger um, is really important within this because I think perhaps if we'd seen China as more of an ally and we'd seen China as somebody who could help us, who we could work with through this, who we could share information, I don't think we would have let the situation get so far out of hand. Um, and I think that's something that we really need to think about in terms of defence and security as we go forward, um, because we are really seeing the same thing with climate change. We're, we're seeing climate change creeping up on us gradually, bit by bit, when there is plenty of time to do something and yet we're choosing not to. And I think if militaries can take that back to their individual countries, to their individual governments and impress on them how much of a danger climate change is, and how much we all need together to, to bring down um, energy emissions, um, I think that would actually perhaps stop us missing the boat in, I think, the way that we did with COVID-19. Uh, and this, I think, really brings us back to this idea of resilience and what resilience is. And so how do we understand resilience? There, there are lots of different models you can use as resilience, but I particularly like this one from Professor Van Breder at University of Johannesburg, which sees resilience as a mediating process that we have some kind of adversity, some kind of threat there that is out there. And what resilience does is it allows us to respond to it in a way that means that the outcome of it is better than it might have been. Um, and that's whether that's climate change, whether it's cybersecurity, whether it's pandemic planning, um, that's really what resilience does. And so we actually look at what could the outcome be? What will the outcome be if we are not resilient to it? 
and then we make ourselves as resilient as possible. And that again goes back back to the ideas of that resilience perhaps being about being making sure that we have very resilient food production processes, we have very resilient energy production, we have very resilient ways of, of population movement, we look at what the world will be like in 50 years time, what areas of the world will be fertile and what areas won't, and actually do we need to start thinking now about making it much easier for the agricultural workers who work in areas where crops aren't going to grow in 30 years time to move into the areas where the crops will grow in 30 years time so that they can be the agricultural workers in that area. And that actually might mean quite a, a different approach to national populations and to nation states than we've had up till now. We've, we've always thought very strongly about borders, about sovereignty, and actually the world is changing in a way where the borders of the world are changing because areas of the world that will be fertile, areas of the world that can support agriculture are not going to be the same areas they were 100 years ago. It doesn't mean that overall the, the earth cannot support the same number of people and it cannot support the same land mass of agriculture, but it's going to be in a different place. And this is something that military, the military and security sector hasn't traditionally had to work with and address in that way and I think that does involve a very significant mindset over the next few years. Um, in terms of what should the armed, role of the armed forces be in supporting populations hit by a clim climatic event, it is essentially humanitarian support, it's something that the military are very very good at, um, it's something I would say what is the role of the armed forces, first of certainly I would say probably the role of the armed forces is not to be armed, and I think the role of the second one is perhaps not to do it with too much force, um, to be more of an NGO organisation, to work, to, to happily carry small children, um, to work with countries that we perhaps traditionally, again, haven't always been our friends. It, it's a great way that we can see with things like some of the US Mercy ships. It's a great way to actually win hearts and minds, is to provide the help that people need, to make them see that you're not their enemy and to be able to work with them. Um, and to perhaps be aware of where these climatic events are likely to hit in the world and to make sure that you're already starting to build up some kind of trust, some kind of footprint in those parts of the world so that you will be accepted and will be able to give the best help as possible when it comes, and also in doing so then head off some of those issues with conflict that we might see. Um, in terms of how to model a climatic black swan event in training, I think military training works very well to actually address any unexpected event to make sure that military personnel are very agile, are very quick on their feet, are very able to think of whatever the situation is. Um, we certainly know the kind of things that people are likely to face um, in a, a future hit by climate change. You know, it's going to be evacuation, it's going to be feeding large numbers of people, it's going to be helping to, to rebuild countries, it's going to be dealing with increasing pandemics and epidemics, and not only from novel diseases that are, are created from deforestation, but also just what we see is that, you know, the breakdown of vaccination programs. You know, in Syria, we saw the breakdown of vaccination program leading to polio epidemics. We see a lack of trust, um, particularly in areas such as uh, Somalia and Nigeria, leading to a lack of trust in vaccines. Um, the more the country actually, the, the more the world starts to pull together and break down some of these barriers between who is seen as traditional enemies, who is seen as traditionally untrustworthy, I think the more we can actually start to work together and overcome some of these. Um, I'm going to end with this slide. It, it's one that I use quite a lot in training. This, this is a flood inundation map. Um, and probably more people in this room will recognise where it's a flood inundation map of than my students do. Um, for those of you who don't recognise it, this is the map of Pella in Hawaii. Um, and, I, and I use it really as an indication of where I think there needs to be a, a real sea change in, in things around res resilience and particularly from the security and military point of view. We know there is a threat from climate change. We know where that threat is. We can model that threat pretty systematically. You know, we know what parts of Hawaii are going to be underwater in 20 years time if we don't act. And yet still we seem very reluctant to. And yet we went to war for Hawaii. And I would go back to that idea of you know, that one systematic shock. If Pearl Harbor is bombed, the world goes to war. And yet we know and we have known for decades that Pearl Harbor is going to be underwater in 30 to 50 years time. And yet we still sit back and do nothing. And so if I would kind of leave you with, with one thought, I, th I think it is that idea of what are we imagining 
when we're imagining the future, what do we want it to look like? We don't want it to be at war, we want it to be at peace. And so what is actually the role of NATO as a resilience organization, as well as a military organization, as an, an organization that has brought peace in Europe and would, you know, is going to want to continue that peace into the next decade? How do you best address that? And how do you best address that through addressing climate change? Thank you very much for having me. Uh, th thank you very much, Jennifer. A very, uh, very, very interesting. Uh, your presentation was was very rich. Um, just extracting two 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 ideas to to sum up. The the, the first one is um, uh, uh, this idea that uh, um, the resilience as a process very very interesting for military organization. Uh, and the, the second one, and I think it will be very interesting after for for the question. It's this idea of cooperation even beyond the alliances was this very important issue of trust. And you mentioned the 21st century with the, the war without enemy. Uh, and what's very interesting is that uh, in the, the global military and strategic landscape uh, for nearly 20 years, we are uh, very in deep of thinking of what about the enemy? What's the new enemy? What's the new kind of enemy? With, for example, the, the issue of hybrid threats and uh, this leading uh, to, to the presentation of our third speakers, Michael Ruller, because um, Mr. Ruller is uh, from NATO International Staff, is the head of uh, hybrid challenges and energy security section in the Emerging Security Challenges um, Division. Uh, Mr. Ruller, before joining NATO, um, Mr. Rulo was well, a Volkswagen fellow at the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and visiting fellow at CSIS. And uh, you joined NATO uh, nearly 30 years ago, you, you mentioned. So you are very, very in deep experience. And uh, thank you for um, presenting this uh, NATO perspective on the issue of, of climate change. Uh, both uh, as a new element to, to take into account for training and capacity development uh, and also of mission planning. Uh, thank you, Michael. The, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. And I, I wish I could answer all the questions that uh, uh, Jennifer Cole just asked about NATO. Um, unfortunately, we're just at the very beginning, I think, of, of, of uh, phrasing the questions, hopefully finding, finding the right answers to them. Um, let me start by saying I think it's 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 not surprising that climate change is now seen by the majority of the population in Western industrialized countries as the greatest threat. It ranks before cyber attacks, before international terrorism, and I think um, uh, it's obvious why, because rising uh, uh, global temperatures will lead to a rise in sea levels and will increasingly cause all kinds of extreme weather events, storms, floods, droughts, uh, forest fires, you name it. Um, I would still be cautious, and I think we, looking at the literature, one has to be cautious to establish a direct causal link between environmental change and conflict. But on the other hand, I think if you have uh, food shortages, water shortages, pandemics, mass migration were, was mentioned, and all other kinds of humanitarian disasters, I think it will at least over time aggravate uh, existing conflicts and perhaps even spark new ones. Um, now, NATO is not the primary at receive when it comes to uh, climate change. I think that role will and is being played uh, by other international actors, such as uh, uh, those, particularly those that can set limits on CO2 emissions, for example. But uh, as a transatlantic security and defense organization, um, NATO is a key forum for discussing and hopefully also acting um, uh, about the security implications of climate change. And NATO has not only military forces, it has uh, agencies uh, and, and, and other instruments that uh, already deal with non-military security issues that are relevant to the climate dossier. In fact, when it's maybe a little known fact, uh, the Alliance has been addressing um, the effects of climate change uh, for many years and in many different ways. Uh, since the 1970s, for example, uh, we have set environmental protection standards uh, for certain military activities. Uh, for example, you can't just build a, uh, a, a camp somewhere uh, uh, as you wish. You need to follow certain procedures uh, from waste disposal uh, and what have you. So we've done this for a long, long time. We've been funding climate-related uh, uh, climate related research uh, also for decades. Um, and, uh, and I'll come back to that uh, later. We have also made considerable progress 
uh, in enhancing energy efficiency in the military, not least with the help of the COE, HOMAS uh, people, uh, to reduce, for example, the consumption of fossil fuel uh, in military camps by using renewables like wind and solar. Um, we also, and this goes back to what uh, Jennifer Cole said, uh, we have considerable experience in responding to humanitarian disasters. Uh, and like, like uh, Jennifer, I agree that we will have to use that experience perhaps more than we want to in the future. Um, for example, in the Pakistan earthquake in 2005, we delivered about three and a half thousand tons of goods of, of uh, humanitarian supplies uh, to the region. Um, and even back then we had the question is, are, are we now a humanitarian disaster help organization or what? And at the end of the day, we, we thought, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, we, we have the wherewithals to do it, so let's do it. And I think we will do more in the future. Uh, NATO is also um, uh, conducting regularly consequence management exercises, field exercises with allies and partner countries. And some of these scenarios that we use are based on environmental challenges. Um, the idea of these exercises is to strengthen the ability of teams from different nations to cooperate uh, across a wide range of relief operations. Um, and this involves urban search and rescue teams, uh, emergency medical teams, uh, decontamination teams and the like. Uh, so all, I'm saying this as, a, as an introduction, just to make clear that a higher profile of NATO on the climate change or in the climate change dossier uh, is conceivable. I would say it's also desirable. Um, it fits into the logic of other initiatives, such as the EU Green, Green Deal, which we've heard about earlier, uh, which aims to make the union carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, now, let me also sound a note of caution before I continue here. As we make the transition from um, towards a future powered by more sustainable forms of energy, let's be realistic, armed forces will continue to consume large amounts of fossil fuel for a considerable period of time. That's simply a fact. Uh, and that's why a new NATO approach to climate change should never downplay NATO's most important contribution to security, which is, and I would argue remains, the prevention of military conflict through collective military power. So uh, what I'm warning against is do not play military security and environmental security against each other. They're both important. The question is how do we bring them you know, sensibly together. Um, so what does this all mean in concrete terms? Uh, what's NATO's role now when, when it comes to meeting the challenge of climate change? Uh, basically, I see three major areas. Uh, the first is awareness, uh, very much like in our energy security um, agenda that Romas laid out at the beginning. Um, we can identify, we can monitor, we can discuss the security implications of climate change in NATO. Uh, we need to integrate climate aspects into our security risk assessments. Uh, we need to conduct more uh, systematic foresight efforts on climate change. Uh, we must leverage NATO's own uh, research, science and technology programs to support research on the impact of climate change. We must increase our awareness on, on region specific climate vulnerabilities. This is something I think the next seminar will, dealing, will be dealing with. Um, particularly, I would say on the Arctic, which of course has five NATO uh, literal states. Um, and the Arctic is seen by some as a, the kind of epicenter of climate change. Uh, and we must also of course look at what climate change means for other actors, which sometimes are actors, let's say, of concern, like China. Simply put, we must understand climate change as a phenomenon that will shape every single aspect of our strategic environment in the future. Um, the second, most perhaps more interesting, is adaptation. Uh, climate change makes it harder for our militaries to, to keep uh, our population safe. NATO troops are often exposed to the world's most hazardous and difficult environments, land or sea, uh, desert, jungle, um, combat operations, training, or disaster relief. It's it's uh, you're you're operating in in a very hostile environment, um, climatically hostile environment. Iraq is a good example. Uh, NATO has a training mission in Iraq. Temperatures in Pakistan last summer were above 50 degrees centigrade. Um, now imagine you are in combat gear, and you have to function in this heat. Um, 
that that's almost impossible uh, to to function for more than a few hours. Um, and it's of course not only the people who will fail, quote unquote, but it's also the equipment that will fail. Um, for example, in Afghanistan, we had to replace helicopter engines because they couldn't cope with the heat. Or we put filters in to cope with the sand, but the filters reduced the, the torque of the engine. So the 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 the, the, the reach of of a helicopter, uh, the the range of a helicopter will will be diminished, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, we had seen that the the salination, the, the salinity of water, changing because of a climate change, uh, is is making um, is is hazardous to turbines uh, of ships. So all of this is to say. Um, it, it affects the way how we operate. Climate change already affects the way how we operate. But if also, of course, it affects the, where we operate. Um, we've seen it, for example, in the Sahel. I think the Sahel is, is one of the, 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 the most interesting hotspots, <laughs> no pun intended, hotspots of, 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 uh, of climate change these days. Um, so we, we need to, to continue to, uh, to look at how can we help, for example, regional uh, governments to cope with the phenomenon of climate change, providing assistance to civil authorities, for example. Um, we also have this problem at, at home. Uh, Pearl Harbor was mentioned, um, looking at the other side of the United States where we have our strategic command, um, Norfolk, Virginia, uh, they also have huge problems with, uh, with rising sea levels. Uh, so uh, in Europe, if you look at the port of Rotterdam, which is the biggest port, also problems with rising sea levels. So in, in other words, we are facing challenges uh, both at, our, at home and abroad. So we need to adapt uh, from combat gear to, to vehicles, to equipment, to infrastructure. Um, basically, it has, we have to in integrate climate change in our entire defense planning process uh, and into our exercises. Um, resilience was mentioned already and we are uh, we are already in, engaged, uh, even before we looked at a dedicated role in climate change, uh, in strengthening the resilience of our infrastructure. Um, uh, I think resilience will become almost the clarion call uh, for for what uh, what military forces will be uh, uh, will, will be doing in or, what, or the homework that military forces have to do in in, in the years to come. We've also uh, uh, gained some experience now, of course, due to the COVID-19 crisis in um, disaster response of, of a, in a medical type of a medical type. Um, we have uh, delivered critical supplies literally around the world. Uh, we have si uh, set up almost 100 field hospitals, uh, transporting patients, medical personnel. Uh, in other words, we, we are gaining experience, um, but uh, it's, it's not yet enough. Um, my third and final point is mitigation. That's the trickiest part. Um, climate change happens, and I'm, I'm simplifying, of course, because you burn fossil fuels. So that's why we all have a responsibility to cut emissions. I think everybody understands that. And the military, and this almost already pointed to that, the military cannot be the innocent bystander in this discussion. As I said earlier, we will use fossil fuel for a long time to come, but we cannot say we're special you know, we are, we are, we are exempt from all uh, future regulations or, or, or limitations. Um, now, the good news is there are technologies out there that allow us to do this, to, to have fewer emissions, uh, fossil, burn fewer fossil fuels, but at the same time, not losing military effectiveness, as Romas was saying earlier. That is, of course, the, the fear of every military leader that he, uh, you know, he has clean, clean fine, but if the tank only uses diesel, then you know, as a military man, I'm not particularly thrilled with this progress. So we need to have win-win situations, get technology that keeps our combat effectiveness and at the same time is good for the environment. And here, I think there are a few examples. Uh, we've, we've just written about that. Uh, uh, there are many more examples. I'll give you just a few. Um, for example, NATO, together with the Center of Excellence, has uh, run a project to reduce the use of fossil fuel in military camps, as I mentioned earlier, by bringing in wind and solar. Um, and this was a very complex thing because you need, first of all, to measure. The military is not used to measure the amount of fuel it uses because so far the military simply gets the fuel it wants. So they don't, they don't need to measure. 
this has we, we've we've done this we've measured so we could see what uh, alternative sources of energy would actually save if you bring them together with a smart grid uh, you know that regulates the diesel generators uh, performance all these kinds of things were very painstakingly uh, put together measured over over several years um, and we we could drive you know, interesting uh, results from that we have of course much more there are allies who are conducting experiments with fossil fuel of course you want a fossil fuel that does not compete with food food uh, generation uh, but that is also being uh, being done um, you have uh, navies for example experimenting with special paint that reduces the water drag on the hull of the ship which makes the ship more energy efficient um, what we do in our private households can also be done by the military insulating buildings was already mentioned uh, using leds instead of you know more traditional uh, lamps all this is being being looked at uh, we can integrate solar panels into the combat gear of soldiers to power some of the or to recharge some of the batteries um, hydrogen fuel um, new battery technologies to store electricity all this is being looked at but i think if we use nato more systematically as a um you know as a as a as a, as a centerpiece of this of this of these efforts we can probably um make further progress not least by exchanging best practices in fact this is one of the things that we've been been, been looking at to, to make nato the centerpiece of all of these these uh, developments let me conclude um with a reference to uh, a famous french uh author Moyer, he once wrote, wrote this piece, Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme, and in this, in this piece, the protagonist receives uh, an explanation of the difference between poetry and prose. And to his own joy and delight, he figures out that he has been speaking prose all his life, and he's very happy about that. He had no idea. And sometimes I think when it comes to NATO and climate change, um, we resemble the, the character of Moyer. Uh, we have been working on environmental protection standards We've supported scientific cooperation on climate change, water security. Uh, we tested smart energy technologies, energy efficient technologies, long before the term climate change really dominated the headlines as much as it does today. In other words, we were speaking prose long before the poetry was put on top of it. And I think this bodes well for our ability to demonstrate leadership in meeting one of possibly mankind's greatest challenges. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Michael, and also for quoting Molière. Uh, and also, uh, thank you for, for stressing out what's the, the main point in the military and this issue with the military and climate change. There is no trade off to be made between uh, operational effectiveness and environmental security. We have to take both into account in the same time without sacrificing one or another. And, and that's the, the very the most important point and most important issue uh, for the years to come in this uh, in this view of uh, interactions between military armed forces and energy security and climate change. Uh, and I think we will go back to 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 this point in the in the question the Q and A session. Uh, finally, as our last speaker was our Mr. Uh, James Graybird from uh, UNFCCC uh, to present uh, the potential role of armed forces and defense in analyzing and helping to mitigate the effects of climate change and also the, the global security issues relating to, to climate change. Uh, Mr. Grabert, you're director of the mitigation division at the UNFCCC and um, uh, you have worked at the UNFCCC for more than, than 20 years now. Um, you're also a uh, greenhouse gases emissions specialist and you're collaborating to the work of the uh, IPT. Uh, that's very important for us to have a, a technical specialist uh, as you are. And uh, um, thank you in advance for your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, let me start by saying that the security community is well aware of the fact that climate change is already a security issue affecting the world today, one that will only increase uh, as time goes on. Um, the global pressures on food, water, energy, and other resources are increasing. Climate change is the threat multiplier that worsens social, economic, and environmental pressures leading to social upheaval and possibly even violent conflicts. Too often climate change is presented especially by the media as an energy or a natural resource or a weather story. 
um, the climate change narrative must go beyond it. it must on the natural resource impact discussion, uh, such as the, we talk about the driving droughts and floods or material changes in technology, for example. The most important of the climate change stories is how it impacts humanity, and it must be carried forward to show that already vulnerable communities become more distressed, more exposed, and more susceptible to the impact of climate change. People are being displaced in their country or to other countries due to these vulnerabilities. If a conflict or several concurrent uh, crises are added, the humanitarian situation quickly ex escalates into security risk. This narrative, this link between a stable climate and human development needed for security, this is uh, the story we need to tell. So what needs to happen to better the climate analysis and negotiations? First of all, countries must have the fullest possible understanding and recognition of all the implications of climate change, including the security imperatives. The interlinkages between climate change and security are multidimensional and complex. Impacts of climate change on security may include intensified competition for food, water, energy, and other resources in regions where the resources are already stretched to the limit due to drought, crop failure, livelihood insecurity, and migration on an unprecedented scale caused by the extreme weather events and diseases and risk related to volatile food prices and provision of that food, and job market, geopolitical instability, and inequality at the more complex level of human systems. The security ramifications of climate change may also include the, the sexual and gender-based violence. This is worsened when water shortages expose women and girls to increased risk of sexual harassment and violence as they must walk further to collect water, or in worst cases, unable to find water sources for their households and fulfill their traditional role in families. Climate change may also increase activities of organized crime and armed groups because undermined livelihoods caused by resource scarcity or extreme weather events can lead people to join armed groups and organized crime to support themselves and their families. In turn, all these security issues deter local, national, and global climate action. In conflict-prone countries, climate-related changes exacerbate insecurity and drift government's resources and focus away from climate change agendas, making them and their people particularly exposed and ill-equipped to adapt to and mitigate climate change. These countries would also not be able to fully engage with regional international mechanisms or attract foreign financial investments for climate adaptation and mitigation due to instability and conflicts. The decisions we make and actions we take in whatever form as we begin to build a low carbon global economy will be better, stronger, and more effective because of the fullest understanding of all the implications of climate change, including the security imperatives. Equally, failure to address these issues will exacerbate the security implications of climate change. Secondly, the understanding and recognition of this vicious cycle must be accompanied by immediate and significant climate change ambition enhancements and implementation by all governments. We must cut emissions as soon as possible I think we've all heard that you know IPC talks about 45% by 2030 and net zero by 2050 if we're going to be on a 1.5 degree track. Um, there's no other path. This is what we have to do. Ambition on this front is critical. National governments, however, are not alone for this work. Businesses throughout the world must align their goals with the Paris Agreement. Those who don't take steps now to align their work with climate change will soon be out of business. Cities, consumers, <clears throat> excuse me, cities consume over two thirds of the world's energy and account for more than 70% of the global emissions. They also uh, play an essential role in ensuring climate safe future for our neighborhoods and local communities. It means that we must minimize the, the creation of carbon intensive infrastructure. This will determine the emission pathway of the next decade policies that promote green growth, diversity, and energy. And to keep and how we live it including transportation, construction, production, supply chain, our relationships with the natural world. Central blueprints to protect people and planet already exists. The Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda. What we need to complete, the work remains for each of us to do and continually increase our ambition. The third essential element is the systemic integration of climate change indicators and risk in all peace building processes and vice versa. Security and conflict risks should be included in climate adaptation and mitigation programming. On the one hand, we need to integrate a climate lens into peace building efforts and mainstream climate change risk and all the development, humanitarian or peace building activities. 
for peacemaking, peacekeeping, or peace building strategy truly sustainable and avoid potentially negative consequences. They need to factor in climate change impacts at all policy stages, early warning and assessment, planning, financing, implementation, and monitoring. For example, while, while we while allocating climate sensitive natural resources such as water and land in peace negotiations, environmental conditions and climate impacts need to be reached competition over those resources. In conflict affected or fragile situations, climate change adaptation and mitigation efforts can also offer entry points for peace building, co benefits, and synergies achieved when communities that are affected by the same climate risk interact and work together. This can also help to ease potential tensions between communities. And on the other hand, climate adaptation strategies and programs must be conflict sensitive in all steps of vulnerability assessment, planning and design, implementation, monitoring, evaluation. This is necessary to avoid creating or exacerbating conflict that contribute to the peace if possible. For example, in Lake Chad Basin, agricultural project projects learn that easy to store grains or crops are also easily stolen, and instead they have pivoted to produce more perishable vegetables. The fourth critical element is the multilateralism. We like to say that climate change begins with one person working hard individually. That's true, but it cannot stop there. One person cannot do it alone, nor can one city alone or one nation. Addressing climate change related security risk requires all sectors of society and levels of government from all nations working together towards a common purpose. The pathways through which risks that contribute to insecurity play out are highly contextual and determined by localized climate stressors, the vulnerability and coping capacities of societies. Therefore, analysis and addressing climate change require broad public engagement in all stages of planning, decision making, and implementation. This means that any measures and policies must be informed by local communities and the local context, complemented with up-to-date climate information and coordinated at all government levels. We've gone further at UN Climate Change and have adopted what we call inclusive multilateralism. This means ensuring all society is included in the discussions of tackling climate change. This includes the members of the security community. This is, all, this is also my answer to the question, should the military have a role in analyzing and mitigating the effects of climate change? Yes, they are also an important part of this crisis. Although there seems to be no direct relationship sometimes between climate change and defense, it is evident that factors that play a role in increasing conflict risk may be reinforced by climate change. Action on multiple fronts, especially the implementation of the Paris Agreement on climate change must be taken and accelerated by all actors, including peace and defense communities. Peace and defense communities could help with data analysis, for example, oceans data from Navy or information from satellites on emissions of deforestation. These could all feed into analysis and assessment for both mitigation and adapt adaptation aspects. Climate related changes have impacts on the military infrastructure, which you already heard about today, and the increased natural disasters would create bigger demand for military support for humanitarian relief. First, for installation and infrastructure, rising sea level, flooding, heat strokes, all this is gonna cause damage to the infrastructure, disrupt the training and exercise procedures. Second, climate change can impact military operations and executing missions, conducting intelligence or logistics transportation. In addition, security forces will be required to maintain a readiness and provide support during humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations. These undermining impacts of climate change on military capabilities and human security mean that the security community must respond to and integrate climate change impacts into their defense strategies and policies for themselves, their nations, and for all the people. First, by embracing the green energy transition, adjusting military infrastructure and logistics systems and supporting not only reduce emissions, but also to improve its own resilience to climate change impacts. This includes emission reductions in, in the built environment, adoption of cleaner and energy efficient equipment, transitions to low or zero carbon energy use in all its operational processes. Second, increasing research and analysis of the security sector on environmental risk, vulnerabilities and impacts of its installations and operation in the local environment and communities, and ensuring that the knowledge and understanding of climate change threats permeates all levels of the military and defense system. Third, developing climate sensitive guiding tools for different severe weather driven scenarios and having more training on the readiness to respond to and be resilient to natural disasters. 
as well as sustainable resource management toward major resource scarcities. And last, collaborating at, with all government departments, security forces of other countries, international institutions, and organizations to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement, adapting to and mitigating against the effects of climate change. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today, and I look forward to the Q&A, and uh, it's good to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, James, for, for your very interesting and very insightful presentation. Um, and the, the, the point I would like to, to underline is this idea that sometimes is not totally unforeseen by the military of the climate change as a threat multiplier. It was very interesting, uh, your point about the uh, sexual related violence, uh, for example, that could be uh, a consequence of uh, cli climate change issues and stressing out also that um, it's a matter of national and transnational issues and uh, the importance of the defense and security uh, continuum uh, in this perspective. So thank you all. Uh, for helping us to create the, the space for discussion, for debate. And uh, I remember you all that we'll have our uh, second webinar on Thursday, 22nd April, uh, this time focused on the specific areas, the Arctic, Mediterranean, and Middle East Africa. Thank you very much. Uh, and let's continue our discussion through mail if you, if you want to. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.